And when uh, traipsing through the desert, you can, uh, you'll see sand dunes effectively everywhere. And it's very difficult to navigate. And so what you have to identify then is what was your starting point? Where do you find yourself now? And where are you headed? And only in that way can you build a trajectory. So why am I beginning with this uh, Irish joke and desert navigation? Because what is the starting point then of decolonization? What is the end point of decolonization? And very importantly, where are we in relation then to decolonization? So how I will proceed now. We very much want this to be uh, a dialogue and I appreciate then uh, Mr. Arnold pointing that out to me. But still, I do believe that I have to provide you with a bit of a primer, at least around my, about my own thinking around decolonization. So I will provide you with five starting points. Each one of those will probably take me between seven and eight minutes to cover. So we're probably looking at somewhere around 40 minutes. So I hope you will be patient as we go through it, because I think afterwards it will provide us then with opportunity for a very robust then conversation, um, as Khalil suggested this would be. So the five starting points that I propose are first off then capitalism. The second starting point then itself would be knowledge or epistemology. The third starting point then for us might be colonialism. The fourth, international law. And the fifth, political economy. So I propose those five and bear with me as I take you through them. Now, international economic law is a regulatory regime. We understand this. But what, in fact, is it regulating? We say that it's regulating economic relations between nation states, and that's fine. We can say that, and that would be accurate. But it's probably more accurate to say that it's the regulatory regime for global capitalism. And if, then, it is the regulatory regime for global capitalism, we must have some type of agreement as to what capitalism is. Now, it's very easy to say capitalism is an economic system. And of course, you would be right. What is the aim of this economic system? Well, the aim of this economic system is accumulation. How much accumulation? Endless accumulation. Now, often people say, well, what do you mean by endless accumulation? Well, ultimately, any single individual is meant to pursue accumulation to whatever extent possible. For the simple reason that within capitalism, there is no definition of the word enough. So does Bill Gates have enough? Does Carlos Slim have enough? Does, uh, let's think about it, what, Jeff Bezos, does he have enough? But not enough according to their personal preferences, enough as defined by capitalism. And that is the point. Within capitalism, we're dealing with endless accumulation, meaning there is never enough. But that part distracts, I find, from the true name of capitalism, which is capitalism as a political system. And what does that mean? Well, the, the allocation of resources, of goods, of services, of whatever it is that we need must take place through the operation of the market. What is the market? Well, the market is very simple. It's a place where people come together to barter, the exchange of goods. But what is most interesting about the market is how the market has its own then theory of distribution. And what is that theory? That is known as plutocracy. And it's a word then that you might be unfamiliar with. You've heard a lot the word democracy, I am sure. You've heard autocracy, I'm sure. You may have heard theocracy, I am sure. But plutocracy, many are quite unfamiliar with. Why? Well, because plutocracy is ruled by wealth. And effectively, what we are saying is that the wealthiest, the most affluent actors enjoy the greatest power. And that is the nature of the market. All one has to do is look to an auction. And in an auction, who wins? 
Is it the person who is most moral, who is most deserving? Is it the person who is most in need? It is the person with the greatest capacity, the greatest purchasing power. And this is an important paradox of the market, and it's one that is often manipulated then in discussions about international economic law. The market is equal in that all of us enjoy access to the market. We are not putting up a big sign as we'd have done historically and said, no blacks allowed. We're not at that point. So everyone is welcome to the market, but your ability to act within the market depends very much on your capacity. So it's democratic in terms of access, but it's plutocratic in terms of operation. So we simply say, when we call for capitalism, is that we want the wealthiest actors to enjoy the greatest political power within the market itself. And let me add one other, two other elements in relation to capitalism before we proceed to our next starting point. The market is often represented as a free market. You've heard this language before, I'm sure. The free market. This is an aspiration. This is the ideal. The UK wishes to be a global leader in free market. Global Britain is a free Britain, we are told. But the free market is a misnomer. In fact, I like to say the free market is a form of branding. All markets enjoy some form of regulation. Where the debate is, as to whether that regulation is a form of intervention or a form of interference. Now, what do I mean by that? Regulations that are normalized to us, regulations that we accept become invisible. We don't see them anymore. So consider very simple examples, restrictions on sales, restrictions on the sales of goods. If you buy an item, this, right? I have this wireless keyboard, right? Notice there's a point here that's missing. This is a faulty device. Do I have permission to take it back? Well, that depends very much as to the laws in place. Can I purchase votes? Can I buy a job? Should I be permitted to buy a judgment? Or for many of you who are university students, should I be permitted to buy a university seat? Or maybe a kidney, a pancreas, a lung. There are a number of restrictions on sales for the simple reason that the market is not free. There are restrictions on the location. Where can you put a liquor store to sell alcohol? Should it be right next to a primary school? What about a brothel? Where should I locate a brothel? Can I locate a brothel anywhere? Labor conditions. Should there be a minimum wage? What about a maximum wage? A minimum number of hours, a maximum number of hours. The market is never free, but we only condemn the market for not being free when we don't endorse the moral value underpinning the intervention that is taking place in the market because we don't regard it as an intervention, we treat it as an interference. So what we ultimately have is a conflict over the boundaries of that marketplace. So when talking about capitalism, we are not talking merely about establishing a market. We are talking about empowering certain actors over others, privileging certain barriers over others. And this brings me to the final point about capitalism. All capitalist economies, all economies are planned. States put forward industrial policies. States own private companies. They have shares. States influence then the market through the actions of state-owned enterprises. They invest in research and development. They invest in infrastructure. 
planning happens at all stages. There are different types of planning, central planning, indicative planning, and so on. But that is neither here nor there. We know that planning is taking place. Why does planning take in place? Planning takes place because of my second starting point and the, 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 our deliberations around decolonization. The first one, capitalism. If we want to decolonize our societies, if we want to decolonize international economic law, should we begin by decolonizing capitalism? That seems to make sense since international economic law is the regulatory regime of capitalism. So what does it mean to decolonize capitalism? But that takes us to the second starting point, knowledge or epistemology. And I began with planning and I said, capitalist economies are planned. Why are capitalist economies planned? Irrespective of whether you are a free marketeer, irrespective of whether right, you happen to be a liberal, irrespective if you are an intern at the Cato Institute, you will plan capitalism. Why will you do so? You will do so for two reasons. The first one is our limited understanding. Our comprehension of the world is very narrow. I often like to say that what I know then is a drop in the sea. If I were Edward Said or Noam Chomsky, I probably know three drops in the sea, significantly more, triple the amount, but still right, relatively very little. We, the result then, because of this limited comprehension, is that when we look at a problem, we don't really understand how to resolve it. So when you say to me, I want to decolonize, I say, okay, that's fantastic. What does decolonization mean? Limited understanding. How do I decolonize? Complexity of the problem. So through a number of ways, we deliberately restrict the choices that are available to us to reduce the complexity of the problem. Now, let me give you an example and you will understand much better. Years ago, where I was working as a lawyer, I worked in a number of different jurisdictions, one of which happened to be the United States, and I lived in Los Angeles. And I was working there. I lived in Los Angeles and uh, Los Angeles is almost the Valhalla of capitalism and the Valhalla of choice. So I would walk into a pharmacy because I wanted to get myself some floss and you look before you, you have a wall and you can get mint flavored, you can get spearmint flavored, you can get peppermint flavored. What is the difference? I'm not particularly sure. You can get cinnamon, you probably have French vanilla, then they would have thin and thick and dento tape an anti-shred and 50 meters of it and 30 meters of it and 100 meters of it. And the list went on and on because you have all of these choices before you. And I recall spending five, seven, sometimes eight minutes to choose which floss I was going to buy for the simple reason that I wasn't sure. The problem became much more complex when faced with all of these different choices. Well, eventually I moved to Sweden and I lived in Stockholm. And I went to the pharmacy in Stockholm and I went to buy some floss. And they told me I had two choices, plain or mint. And I bought the mint and I left. And the decision took me three seconds. Really interesting when you simplify then the options that are available to you, we can make decisions. So this is what we term on some level, right? bounded rationality bounded rationality. We deliberately bind our rationality to account for the limits of knowledge. Now, what do I mean? There's only so much that I know. And because there's only so much that I know, I have to make a choice based upon imperfect information. But there's more than just that. The law intervenes to place bounds around the choices that are available to me. So can I choose then to go to a, a liquor store at 7 a.m.? Well, that depends on whether or not the state permits me to do so. 
it regulates the options before me because it is trying to structure society in a certain way. So we want to make rational choices. That is what economic actors do. We understand that for one economic, the first thing is rational economic actors. Study liberalism, study capitalism, read Adam Smith. You will find that all of us are rational economic actors. So we want to be rational, but how can we be rational in a world that is this complex, that is this uncertain, and where the information that is available to us is imperfect? Can we presume to know what is in our self-interest? And that leads me to the more important question about this starting point for decolonization. Self-interest according to whom? Self-interest according to a man? Self-interest according to a woman? Self-interest according to a person who is transgender? Self-interest according to a Muslim? Self-interest according to a Hindu? Self-interest according to a Christian or to a capitalist? Chinese, Egyptian, Kenyan, Colombian, Mohawk, Maori, who's self-interest? Which is another way of asking, whose epistemology? Whose knowledge system do we define self-interest? Do we measure self-interest against? Is all knowledge equal, equivalent? Is all knowledge the same? Is there really only one epistemology in the world and one epistemology that international law should be structured around? Well, I ask this question because of my third starting point in this debate on decolonization. My third starting point is colonialism. Because colonialism is a Eurocentric view of how to structure the world. Now, this is not to say then that the only peoples who ever settled others, whoever brutalized others, were European. No, that's not what the argument. But the industrialization of colonization, similar to the industrialization of slavery, was carried out by Europeans and we are still suffering the legacies of those today. So when we want to decolonize, we don't merely study colonialism in the abstract. We study it in the way that Europe pursued it, the way that Europe implemented it. And many of you I know will have read Anthony Angi, and you would have read his book on imperialism, sovereignty, and international law. And you would have read then about Francisco de Vitoria. And as you were reading about him, you would have seen that the beginning of international law came with discovery, came with colonization. Not colonization that our own continent in Africa suffered then in you know, the 18th and 19th century onwards, but a different type of colonization. And what did Vitoria say? Vittoria said that under Jus Gentium, the law of nations, which is really the law of peoples, but translated as the law of nations, we had the freedom to discover, the freedom to settle, the freedom to proselytize, and the freedom to trade. According to what? According to law itself. But isn't law made by us? Isn't it human made? But De Vittoria was operating within a natural legal system. So he says, in nature, there is law. And that law in nature, that natural legal system, guarantees those rights and the associated responsibilities. Now, this created a peculiar situation then for non-Europeans. Because young Europeans arrive and they see all these people there and they turn to Vittoria and they say, as Columbus did, 
They say, what am I meant to do with these natives? And this is where Jus Gentium proved to be contradictory. Now, according to Vittoria, and later according to Grotius, and according to Vettel and Westlake, and all of these publicists who you would have studied, what they said to us is that the territories found outside of Europe were terra nullius. And what did that mean? It meant they belonged to no one. The inhabitants there were largely irrelevant, meaning you could settle their lands. But this was peculiar and led to a bit of a contradiction. What natives could do, however, is they could contract with Europeans to grant European powers exclusive rights, exclusive trading rights within those territories. So on the one hand, the native was not sovereign and enjoyed no rights over the land, meaning Europeans, but they could contract with Europeans for exclusive trading rights, in which case that contract had to be respected, both in relation to other European powers, meaning other European powers could not settle the land after it had been settled by one of them, and meaning once these indigenous peoples began to make legal claims for the theft of the land, the judiciary can turn around and say, but look, you signed over your rights. So it created a simple reason that the law itself was not rational. The law was interest driven. The aim was ultimately to dispossess people of their land and to dispossess them of their land in perpetuity. All of that was taking place within a particular epistemology. Now, what do I mean by this? Many of today's legal questions, those that we find most difficult to engage with, those questions pertain to these activities that took place during the European era, during that colonial period and the legacies they produced. Consider a very easy example, the imbalance on the UN Security Council. It is odd to say that we enjoy sovereign equality, but that some states are more sovereign or more equal than others. Think the doctrine of uti posidaitis. That doctrine and how it reaffirms the boundaries that were established during the colonial era. The Vienna Convention, you must respect treaties irrespective of the administration that was in power at the time that assented to the treaty and whether it was a native one or a foreign one. The theory of statehood, is it sufficient to declare that you're a state? Well, if that were the case, presumably Palestine would be a state today. Presumably Taiwan would be a state. Presumably Tibet would be a state. Presumably a lot of these places that want to declare their independence would be states. You would have breakaway groups across every state in the world today if we were operating on a declaratory theory. But we also have the constitutive theory, which brings in this element of recognition that is a little peculiar and contradictory once again. And what about then slavery? Is it possible to obtain reparations for one of the greatest crimes ever committed against a people? Well, not according to the doctrine of intertemporality. So when we say we want to decolonize, are we saying then that we want to redress all of these legacies that were produced during the European colonial era? Because if so, each one of you should reread Macau Matua's article on redrawing the map of Africa, 1995. Because he simply says, 
The entire map of our continent is a colonial construct. My own country, Egypt, with a now neighboring country, Sudan, used to be one country. But one of the gifts that the British left us was separation. And so now we are two. And I say, is that what I am to decolonize? What exactly am I decolonizing? Am I decolonizing the legacies of colonialism? Am I decolonizing epistemology? Am I decolonizing capitalism? Or, and these are the final two, am I decolonizing international law? I mentioned to you just now a series of international legal doctrines that are colonial in character. Is that when I am decolonizing? Well, consider this. The global legal architecture is structured around five types of law. You are most familiar with municipal law. That is understandable. And also international law. But those are two of the five. There is also transnational law. There is also supranational law. This is what we are pursuing across the African continent now. But there is also outer state law. And outer state law is a term that most of you have never heard of. Outer state law is merely a declaration by one state as to this is how I will act unto the world. And what we regard as international law is in fact European outer state law. All those precepts that were established historically that we rely upon today, all of those were established by Europe as a way of advancing European interests. And in all instances, Europe, because of its own reasons, made the state primordial. So what we understand about the law is that the law formalizes the preferences of certain constituencies over others. It's not so radical. It is not Marxist. It is not revolutionary to say that. We are privileging the interests of some groups over others. Because law is transactional. And those who are in positions of power are able to wield law to their advantage. But law is also existential, meaning it ultimately shapes how we see ourselves and how we see others. So one can go back to this 15th, 16th, and 17th century, and you would look and the notion of racism would not have existed at the time because we had not systematized the denigration of a particular group of people because of their complexion. The law did that. And the law did that because there were some important economic interests that could be advanced in achieving that. And religion helped. And then in the end, people came to see others as superior and inferior. And notice how generations later, we're going, what, 15, 18, 20 generations later, those ideas still hold today. So are we proposing to decolonize international law? Well, international law is a system of social order. It is one that is meant to provide a means of regulating relations between equal and sovereign states. It is a bulwark against chaos. Why would anyone want to decolonize that? That is everyone's advantage. Every state benefits. More than just that, it is a mechanism of restraint. States are declaring, I will restrain myself. I will not engage in these type of behaviors. I will limit my own sovereignty. 
I will compromise. I will entreaty with you. Is that what we want to decolonize? Does that even make any sense? But we also know, particularly those of us from the war, that law is an instrument of domination. According to Tony Blair, and he said this in Westminster, slavery was legal. Colonization was legal. War is legal. Occupation is legal. According to which law? According to whose epistemology? And for what purpose? And this brings me then to my final starting point. And we loop around back to international economic law. I began and I said international economic law is the regulatory regime for global capitalism. Why did we establish a regime of international economic law? The argument was very simple. The world is interdependent, or at least right around the time when it was launched with the IFIs in that, you know, after uh, Europe had bludgeoned itself in the second great European war, we said the world is becoming interdependent. We must denationalize access to resources. We must denationalize access to capital. We must denationalize production. We are interdependent. So international economic law facilitates that interdependence by allowing the free flow of all of those essential components to the functioning of an economic system. Now that sounds fantastic. But here's the catch. We remain subdivided in nation states. And because we are subdivided in nation states, that interdependence is something then, that compromise is something I'm willing to engage in to the extent that it allows me to maximize my self-interest, to maximize my individual and my national prosperity. But here's the catch. In a world of scarce resources, in a world of limited opportunities, how do I maximize self-interest? Well, the answer is very simple. At the expense of someone else. And so I'm often asked the question, well, what is being to do? And I used to be asked the question, what is Africa to do? And I said, we will achieve the same lifestyle, the quality of lifestyle that Europe enjoys today once we figure out who we can colonize. Because the European standard of living was produced through plunder, through colonization, through exploitation. That is the nature of it. Europe would not be Europe had it not bathed in the blood of others the way it did. So whose blood are we going to bathe in? Who are we going to exploit? Who are we going to enslave? Because that seems to be the only formula for achieving what Europe has. And this is why I say to you, should we decolonize political economy? The capitalist system is based on an assumption and a theory. And both assumption and theory are wrong. And we know it, but we hold on to it because it maintains the fiction. What is the assumption? The assumption is that prosperity is infinite. Everyone can win. If you choose the free market, you too can be successful. Okay. Fantastic. So we have limitless resources available to us. We have opportunities. But what is the theory? Well, the theory is that of comparative advantage. Countries reap gains by specializing in what they are best at producing and trading with others. 
Okay. So do you want to own a banana plantation like we have here? Do you want to own a manufacturing plant of mobile phones such as what they have in Korea? Or do you want to own Threadneedle Street, the city of London? Well, chances are, if you're wealth-minded, you pick the third because you know that is where the greatest gains can be made. But you still need to eat, which means you still want someone picking the bananas. So is that what I meant to decolonize? Political economy, human nature, and I'm really pleased that I stuck to time because I've gotten through these five starting points in the 40 minutes that I had planned. And that is where I think we should begin our conversation. You're interested in decolonizing international economic law. Does that involve decolonizing capitalism? Does that involve decolonizing the epistemology that guides our thinking? Think in Gugi Wat Yongo, decolonizing the mind. Does that involve decolonizing the colonial legacies that continue to litter the world, including the borders across our continent? Is it the regime and all of those doctrines that reproduce the status quo? Or is it political economy? The impossibility of, achieve, of achieving a life of dignity for all unless we compress the privileges of the few. Is that what we propose to decolonize? I leave the question to you. I am assuming there's a chair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Over to um, you, Khalid. Thank you, thank you. I was just thinking about your question. It was very, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think the words robust and uh, intellectual that were used earlier are very appropriate for today's session. Um, so I would like to open the floor up for any responses, any questions, any comments, um, please feel welcome. If you'd allow me to start. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for the discussion, uh, Dean. It was quite interesting. And from what you said and from my understanding of international economic law, the whole aspect of free trade came about after the decolonization because the colonial powers still needed free flow of goods from the developing countries. But to decolonize the international econ economic law structure, we'd have to start from the ground up, which means demolishing everything, is what I think. Because if we were to look at even the arguments in place, for example, the comparative advantage of most developing states, which is the pillar, one of the pillars of free trade is cheap labor and raw materials. Now, cheap labor and raw materials doesn't gather as high of a price as processed goods from, from the developed countries do. And the agreements that have been put in place, such as the agricultural agreements in the WTO, are meant to continue and to perpetuate this system that's restricting the development. So I think that there needs to be a complete restructuring of the international economic law sphere. And otherwise, there's no uh, decolonization that can take place. Prof, would you like to respond to that or should we take further comments first? 
Um, so um, I allow it as in obviously I defer to you on this. Uh, however you want to run this session is entirely up to you. Um, it's a very interesting comment. I can comment on the comment um, um, or we can open it up to others to comment on the comment. I mean, again, it's your session. So you advise me and I'm happy to uh, comply. Uh, you could respond and then if there are any further comments to your comment or the earlier comment, then maybe more I can comments. Just add that <laughs> Yeah, sure, go ahead. Well, I, I think I also agree with Kelly that we need a complete restructuring of the whole system. Uh, yeah, I do believe that, uh, just as Kelly, that international economic law can still, and international law at large, can still make a difference. But then, um, who can lead it to making this particular difference that we are talking about right now? Who is this person who is willing to do that? Because uh, what I've noticed, at least from just reading, the minute you come out as a critical scholar talking about these things, you'll be quickly labeled as a Marxist. And Marxist, whatever is really like, or even like a feminist, really like all these critical perspectives, it's like there is a bit of resistance. People are, people are scared of critical perspectives. People are scared of Marxism, feminism, whatever else can be. And, usually being labeled as such, it's like this person is here to confuse us, especially a Marxist. So maybe you can comment on that and in your experience yourself as a critical scholar, because the views that you hold, I mean, the logical conclusion is that people will just say this person is a Marxist because you, you speak of the masses. You, which is true that religion uh, had a great part to play in colonization, slavery, and all those uh, vices that we undergone as global South uh, people, so to speak. Yeah, now that's really my problem. Who is going to lead this restructuring? Uh, because as you've done even yourself some research, even the way like if we are to look at these epistemologies, the way like knowledge production and, and everything, the things that we are being fed up with in our schools and everything are not um, good enough to, to equip up with the skills that are going to, um, to restructure the system as Kelly is suggesting. And uh, the great scholars like yourself, once you publish, it is somewhere in a journal which is not accessible. So like, I find that we're in a kind of a fix. So I don't know. Yeah, to add to what Nchiko has said, as I was reading the, the readings that were sent, um, they were very, profound and sophisticated in theoretical terms, but it occurred to me that not only those engaged in academia, or most of us who are engaged in academia, such as us, are in need of these perspectives. So how do we, uh, how, does, how do these perspectives and how do these, how do the objectives of, of um, decolonization, for example, uh, whittle down to um, people who are perhaps not in a position to, you know, access this material, or at least uh, in, are not willing to understand those theoretical sophistications. How do we make it accessible? How does it whittle down so that there's a, there's actual change and not just academic discussion? Yeah, all uh, fantastic questions, near impossible to answer, uh, but certainly then good fodder for a uh, conversation. Uh, so first off, uh, apologies, it's pronounced Inchico and not Nico. I don't know why I was thinking it was a silent C. So Inchico, I will pronounce it correctly moving forward. Um, so many thanks then. It's um, Kelly, right, who began. Kelly, I see you there and I say, yeah, perfect. Um, you provided the uh, as in you and I are clearly in agreement on that. Uh, hence why I mentioned the bananas and the mobile phones and the financial services. Um, because of course there is necessarily a type of stratification then between uh, the, um, the um, rate of return, depending on the type of economic activity that you engage in. Um, and I, I suppose that my starting point in terms of responding to you and responding to others in terms of the nature of law as in, it's, it's always fascinating then to meet students who arrive and, you know, it, and, and they start off when they're, they're legal studies and they say they want to help people and they want to use the law to fight for justice and they want equality and they want to create opportunities and challenge poverty and so on and so forth. 
the only thing I can think is, is oh bless. <laughs> I recall those days. Um, Prof, Prof, are you still here? Or is it just my screen? For the years. Um, can you not hear me? Can you Sorry, hear we me? lost you for a bit. Okay, let me switch the uh, to my uh, hotspot then, because I think I'm having trouble with my Wi-Fi. Okay, that's fine. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I will change to the hotspot. All right. Uh, how is that in terms of the connection? Yeah, we can hear you clearly, I think. Uh, excellent. All right. Let's go with that then. Uh, so what I was saying is that, um, and I was, I was kind of being a little facetious, and I was speaking about how students come with all of these grand visions of what they're going to achieve with their law degree. And we quickly disabuse them of that uh, by making clear that, in fact, there are quite a few limits in terms of what you can do with the law because the law doesn't exist to promote justice or to promote equality or to address issues of poverty. The law exists primarily to preserve the status quo. Now, when I say that, we say, well, it, it, it does change. And I say, of course, but the question is, in which direction do the winds of change, where do they begin? Hence why I asked the question, what is the starting point for this decolonization movement? So if we think of the law, it's not just that the law is slow moving, it's not just that it's contingent on on institutions, it's not just that it's captured by venture, by uh, established interest, indentured interests. It's not merely that. The law, the law is ultimately whatever we want the law to be, and so if we put in place a series of rules that ultimately produce these outcomes, and then we look to preserve those rules as we are doing we're re reproducing the outcomes as well. And so when we look at international economic law and what was coming through uh, the World Bank and, um, and the establishment of the WTO and so on and so forth, at no point did anyone say, we want then the people of Africa to enjoy the standard of living of the people of Europe. For the simple reason that we know it's an impossibility. It would collapse the ecosystem overnight. And a very easy way of evidencing this is to look at the footprint, the, the consumption of resources. So Europe consumes 80% of resources. That is the cost of, or Euro-America, we should say, that is the cost of that lifestyle. 80% of the resources that are available, but they only make up 15% of world population. So with so small a population and yet so large a consumption of resources, it merely tells you how costly that lifestyle is. So it's not so much about uplifting the standard that we enjoy across the African continent. It's rather about lowering the standard that they enjoy in Europe, because that is the problem. The problem isn't our poverty. The problem is their profligacy. And international economic law was certainly not set up to do that. And I even make this point in relation to a, uh, to a book review that I wrote earlier this week for Opinio Juris, and that's what I conclude on. I say international economic law doesn't prohibit exploitation. Of course not, because exploitation is at the heart of the system. And then to bring it to the next point there, we link it to it and we say two things that are coming out of it, both by uh, Inchiko and then by Khalil. Transforming the world right, is a struggle. It's not so much as nothing that comes easy. And there are those people who are in academia who surround me. Right? So I think of the professors who I work with. I think of my fellow deans. I think of the principal. I think of the ministers of education. I think of all of them. 
all of them have benefited from the system as is. And what we're turning around is saying, as you said, and then as Kelly said, we really needed to tear down this entire structure. But when tearing down that entire structure, you're also tearing down the privilege. Why would I do that? I, I, I'm quite, I, I'm, I'm quite pleased being privileged. It keeps me well fed. It keeps me clothed. I can gallivant around the world. There's all kinds of things that I can do by being privileged. And I know it comes at the expense of others. And so I'll engage in a little bit of false generosity here and there. But am I really going to challenge the structures themselves? Well, probably not. Because I know that as soon as I move out, someone else is going to swoop in and exploit. So Khalil, when you say to me you want actual change, I say there have been lots of instances of actual change. As in, look throughout the world, the world is always then in the midst of upheavals. It's always in flux. There is a dynamism to it. That dynamism, I have to say, virtually always, always, right, comes from you. And what do I mean when I say you? I mean young people. Right? Dr. Omiyunu, myself, we're established. We are now part of the structure. And we're looking for ways to tweak the structure to make it a little more advantageous, a little more equitable. We're And every time you come in and you, in, we are emboldened by seeing that. But we also see then right, that you yourselves begin to, this, you, you undergo this type of metamorphosis because you come to see the logic and you come to enjoy a little bit of the privilege as well. And you start to write the academic articles because you think of, yes, Dr. Omiyunu, yes, <laughs> we know it. And you start gunning for those positions as well. That is the nature of it. And that is what is most challenging, which is why I bring it back to what I said before. Must we decolonize epistemology? Is it very much the way we understand the world? Thank you for the answer. Um, we could have Nawal and then Collins, since there is. Yes, hello. So um, let's just start that my, uh, can you hear me first? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Um, my phone is connected, so I don't know if this question has been addressed before. Um, but I will go ahead and, and um, lay my point. So, uh, first of all, thank you for um, the beneficial information you gave us all. Um, I would like to um, comment or ask on a point you've mentioned, which is when you said that if you want to or aspire to application um you know uh colonize states before right? is by and well, again, they also based and using your metaphor uh, with the blood of external territories. 
However, and on the basis of Ibn Khaldun's uh, cyclical theory, colonization and decolonization, uh, rising and falling of civilization are almost a law of nature or the law of humans, right? Uh, so, trying to interfere here, which is the, the human need of regulation, order, hierarchy of power. So is it really a question who should we think to colonize in order to um, Sorry, we've lost you. No. Hello, Noel. Hello, um, Okay, maybe you could address a point up until where it reached, and then we can edit, hand it over to Collins to ask his question. Perhaps we should invite uh, Collins to ask his question now with both of them and she might rejoin then before hearing, before I um, articulate an answer. Yeah, that's also fine. Collins, you can ask the question there. Oh, thanks uh, so much. Uh, Dean, thank you also for for uh, lecture, so to say. Um, I am of the opinion that uh, we need to be op optimistic uh, when we're talking about decolonization because this is something that is possible. In which case, um, and also considering that Africa is so diverse and so far we've seen some different um, aspects of trying to decolonize Africa as a continent, yeah? We have the Gaddafi way where, you know, he was proposing things uh, that could unite Africa as a whole, for example, uh, having one currency, some, of, some have proposed, uh, you know, strengthening the African Union and making, and making sure that it's not just like a pseudo uh, United Nations or the rest of the um, uh, uh, inter uh, international uh, um, organizations so as to serve the, the purpose of Africa. You spoke about using a tool like construing colo the colonization uh, similar similar to how colonization was construed and you dwelt on this so much when you were talking about epistemology and this means that if we must decolonize we must use a tool in which case we must use the same tool that was used for colonialism yeah now i want to get what your opinion is on this factor what tool better serves africa considering our diversities, for example, what tool did Europe use? Uh, were they, uh, did they do it in unity, so to say, or, I mean, before the, uh, the, the, I mean, before Africa was divided or when they were dividing Africa, how united were they and what tool best serves Africa at this point in time? And if, if your opinion on that is that we should move as a whole, like we should be united, for example, um, what step better suits that, um, that, that proposal? Is it the Gaddafi way or is it the Kagame way? Or, I mean, what step could you pro propose that could help us to get to that place where we want to be, which is bringing down the, the standard of living of Europe and raising that of Africa so that we can be enjoying um, equal status of life. Yep, thanks. So Noel asked for her question to be read, uh, it's in the chat. So her question is, um, is the question, who should we think colonize in order to leave the status of current Europe? Or is it a question of how can we reform the human nature of order and hierarchy? I'm smiling because I, I think BC joined the call and I'm sure he's laughing now at the prospect of me answering these questions. Um, how do we reform human nature? Uh, which tool am I going to deploy to unite Africa? Really easy questions. So let me deal with those in turn. Um, so the point in, ter in terms of the who should we colonize? 
what I was merely highlighting is that, and this is where I, I'm, I'm pointing to the fictitious nature then, uh, or the, fi the fictions upon which international economic law rest. And the fictions include that theory, prosperity for all. You know, so um, rising tides lift all boats. The prosperity for all is, is, is fallacious. And it's fallacious because we have a scarcity of resources. So prosperity for all is not possible. The flip side then to prosperity is immiseration. And there's some very interesting work that's been written by Susan Marks, an excellent scholar at uh, LSE. Um, a couple of articles that she's written, one is entitled The Bottom Billion, and another one is in which she explores law as um, through the lens of exploitation. And the argument is effectively that this is built into it. And we understand that. And so, and I recall this even uh, conversation I had with uh, my daughter years ago. We were living in Montreal. I was working at McGill at the time. We were living in Montreal and we were living in a high rise. And she was young. She might've been, I think maybe 10, I guess, maybe 10 at the time. And we we're living in this high rise uh, on the 18th floor. And we were looking down and we were looking at a park and there were people, you know, effectively the tent city, people who pitched their tents in the park. And she says to me, daddy, why are people living in the park? And I said, well, they live there so we can live here. Because their right, houselessness, their impoverishment makes our affluence possible. So there's a dialectical relationship between them. And that theory of prosperity for all denies that dialectic. And it denies it because specifically then, because otherwise you won't have that buy-in. People won't commit to it. The only way you commit to it is if you hold out the possibility that one day you too could be in the high rise. Because if I tell you that you're going to continue living in the shanty town, you'll continue to inhabit the landfill, you'll continue then to suffer malnutrition, of course, why would you work? Why would you go along with it? Because you're cursed from the outset. But you have to believe in that possibility. And so that theory plays more of an ideological role than anything else. So when I'm saying who should we colonize, I'm pointing to the fact that European standard of living is built on the backs of others. And this is where I even said in that review the, earlier this week, I say, does anyone truly believe otherwise? If it was not for us, would Europe be Europe? And the answer is, of course not. And today, this is what's comical, is to see the amount of resentment because they've actually come to believe then their own fictions. And I say, never underestimate the power of self-deception. Would France be France if it wasn't for Algeria and Vietnam? Would England be England if it wasn't for and so much then of the African continent. Could England continue to do that if we did not have this disparity in terms of trades? So that is what we are trying to overcome. And so drawing attention to it isn't so much to make the argument that we should have, we should colonize someone. No, it's not that. It's merely saying, if that's the, the only model that has proved effective, what is the alternative that you're proposing? So this brings us then to right, Collins' question. Now, Collins, I think you must have upset in Chico because before we were just regarded as Marxists. Once you bring in the situation changes altogether. This is now being recorded. Each of you is going to be picked up later today. I'm sorry. It was nice knowing you. A united Africa is at another level. And I even recall at one of the events that Afronomics organized that I attended and I had posed a question. And actually, Dr. Omiyunu, you were there and you were speaking on this. And one of the questions that I posed was, is then the FTA, is this African neoliberalism? Is that what we're experiencing? Now, it's an interesting question. And it's an interesting question because I am all for it then in terms of pursuing this type of unity. And we want that unity at every level imaginable. But is that unity being pursued along the same epistemological then and political economic lines 
that resulted in the European Union. Because the European Union came, became the European Union once again on the backs of others, in which case we're facing that same struggle and we ask ourselves, who are we going to exploit? Because it may not be that we can exploit beyond our borders, but it may be that we ultimately exploit within our borders. Which is why debates around basic income, um, minimum and maximum wages, all of that becomes really important in terms of how are we going to structure then labor relations, how are we going to structure wealth relations, how are we going to facilitate distribution then, the allocation of um, the resources, are we going to follow that same flawed democratic capitalist model, the social welfare model that we saw across Europe, or is there more creativity in the African continent because we're dealing with different conditions? So I don't think it's so much of whether we should go the Gaddafi route or we should go the Kagame route, but it's rather saying, and this is why I bring it back to the issue of decolonization, are we challenging then the order of things or is it merely we want to transplant the order of Europe into Africa? In which case there are many of us, including most people who are on this call, who would do quite well. But that is also the case in Europe. And so that is what I find why I say this is a conundrum and I come to you more with questions than I do with answers. And when I put it to you in terms of what should we decolonize, I'm not saying it merely to trouble you. I'm saying it because I need your help. What should we be looking into? Is it all of the above? Am I Eurocentric in my thinking as well because I'm in favor of the FTA? Am I liberal because I do believe in individual rights? All of these questions start coming to mind. And I'm not sure what the answer is. So Collins, maybe we throw it back to you because you say optimism is possible. And I say fantastic, right? You can even look at Ngugi and say everything that he went through. <laughs> and you say he remains even to this day optimistic. So optimism is fine, but I don't think it's so much a matter of optimism. I think it's something else. At times I think it's strategy. At times I think it's struggle. Most of the time, I think it's youth. And I think my ideas are already anachronistic or already antiquated, and you should be giving me the lecture. Tell me, what should I do as dean? Guide me. Uh, thank you so much for that answer. And um, I think you, uh, you, you kind of answered the question um, that you are asking me because you you, uh, you accepted the fact that this is something that is a conundrum, yeah? It, this is something that is super complex and it is not really uh, a destination, but it's a journey. So if it's a journey, then it means we just have to be developing uh, by the day in terms of strategy and in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the literature, the discussion we're having uh, and all of that. But as for the strategy that could best work, I don't think I'm in that position where I can be able to give a perfect answer. Although I could say that uh, maybe one of the ways to start is uh, going on Google at the younger way. I mean, start from the mind. And um, based on the conversation that I've had with a couple of people on this platform, for example, in Chico, um, this is something that is super important because uh, if you find out uh, when you were talking, you, you said that one of the ways of moving forward and achieving this goal that we aim to see or to achieve is by, you know, engaging the youth the more. But you find out that in the universities where we are, even the way things are taught, are taught in a way that we can be critical, that we can, we can be strategic enough to tackle them in terms of uh, when we are talking about the, the capital spoke about the international economic law and public international law as, as a whole, yeah? So decolonizing the mind from that point of uh, what we receive uh, could be one of the ways to move forward. But as for what the main tool sh should be or could be, I don't think I have um, a strong opinion to be able to answer that, yeah. I wonder if I could add another point and I wonder. So 
to me, what I find most challenging is, and, and I would love to hear from others on this, that theory that I mentioned earlier right? and the assumption. So the comparative advantage on one end, but primarily the assumption there that prosperity for all is possible. And I wonder if then admitting to ourselves that prosperity for all right, is fallacious and people will be impoverished as others are enriched. That is that dialectical relationship. Of course, it's the case. So once we admit that, this is where I wonder if we can start to think of measures that will ultimately limit how much some can accumulate. Now, why do I say this? I often like to explain this in relation to the floor and to the ceiling. And I say the reason that social welfareism worked somewhat in Europe, right around the 40s and 50s and 60s, why it worked somewhat was for two reasons. One, because they still enjoyed then, as was pointed out by someone here, I can't recall if it was in Chico or not. Actually, no, it was Kelly. As was pointed out, as in Europe continued to enjoy access to the resources in the colonies, even in that post second great European war. And that was what allowed Europe to rebuild itself as quickly as it did. So it was that, and uh, really interesting, if you, if you haven't read it, then go ahead and read it, Neocolonialism by Nkrumah. And he points out how the social welfare system in Europe was itself fueled then by the resources that, they have, that we have in Africa. But still, one thing that they did do at the time, which proved effective, was putting in place a ceiling. And so across Europe, right around the 50s and 60s, you had it in Canada, you certainly had it in the United States as well. You had super taxes, super taxes that went as high as 100%, meaning if you, or if you earned above a particular threshold, then 100% of it would ultimately be turned over to the state. And so you had a far more progressive tax rate than what you have today. And the idea was that at least if you limit the ceiling, you can use that wealth to prop up the floor. And so in the end, it's not as though anyone said we should lower the floor that resulted in austerity. It was rather we began to poke holes in the ceiling. And as we poked holes in the ceiling, greater wealth began to move upwards. And now, of course, that floor was in a free fall. It could no longer be sustained because you didn't have the kind of revenue that you had before. So I wonder even in terms of these conversations in relation then to the future of Africa, if we put aside this idea then of us colonizing Europe, let's just put that aside. I like it as an intellectual challenge. How could we achieve that? But if we were to put that aside and then say that we want to think of policies we could implement, would a super tax be the way to go? Might that be something to explore? Or at least thinking of ways of making then the ceiling more robust a maximum wage, a minimum basic income, those kind of things where we're trying to even it a little bit. So we're not saying we're going to eliminate immiseration altogether, just in the same way we're not eliminating prosperity, but we're just trying to reduce the inequality that we know capitalism will precipitate. I wonder if that's a way to go and if we begin by saying prosperity for all is impossible, we cannot achieve that, or is that too far? Does that in itself then ultimately collapse the system as a whole? Um, I think we could have Maha and then Ali, and then uh, give answers to both questions or comments. Thank you. I found this discussion very, very interesting. And if I could first just comment on that question on prosperity, of whether prosperity for all is a fallacy. Um, this immediately reminded me of something that Eslava and Bahuja mentioned when they were talking about the universality promise of international law. And they discussed how perhaps we should think of it as a promise or as a goal, but something that practically isn't achievable. And I think I find that quite um, interesting because I, I think 
to reject the idea that prosperity for all is even something we should look at is a mistake. I think it should be there, but on the horizon and per perhaps we'll never reach it, but it should always be that benchmark that we kind of try to get as close as we can towards. Um, and my question or what I want to discuss goes back to what Kelly and Njiko talked about. Um, and so in theory, I feel like I understand, like as a law student, I understand an oppositional approach to the international economic order and uh, an approach that we should reform it from within. Um, but then when we get to the practical aspect of that, I, I can't figure out how that would play out in the real world and what my role as perhaps a lawyer or a critical scholar in the future would be. And if I were an oppositionist, how I would go about that, what kind of changes I would propose. So I wanted to ask whether you think that third world approaches and decolonization exist only in theory or whether there is a practice and I'm just missing it or where that practice really should be or should lie. Thank you. Ali? Um, can you guys hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Um, thank you, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Dean. And I'm really, really glad to attend this forum because I think at some point in time when you're speaking, my heart was suddenly was palpitating because it gave sense to something that I've been thinking about so many times. The problem that I've always had a bit is um, the alternative, the ideal alternative has been um, collectivization, right? So when we have a model of collectivization, then that essentially means that it is morally equivalent to prosperity for all. Now the discussion then becomes more political, but in the alternative model that I've always been thinking of recently, even when it, come, when it comes to um, debating systems and debating frameworks, is why um, when, when we talk about the foreign direct investment way, right? And when we talk about, yeah, foreign direct investment. So assuming, that we effect foreign direct investment and we debunk this philosophy that foreign direct investment is um, colonization, but um, maturity and mechanization of our resources. So that essentially means that we are recolonizing them. So we're essentially producing our raw materials at a sustainable price to essentially boost the economic system. But even another way of mechanizing ourselves is that we are mechanizing the legal frameworks, right? Mechanizing the intellectual preparation um, property frameworks to be more mature. So that in itself leads to maturity of policy frameworks and also leads to maturity of our resources because we are producing more in itself, right? Now, the so my question is, would we, is it, could we be successful in effecting a scientific model that would create sufficiency? Because at a point where we boost sufficiency, where we overflow and are stealing in itself, then that essentially means that achieving social prosperity becomes extremely easy because we already have resources. We boosted, um, we, we did boost our market system, and we also we did boost our policy frameworks and stuff. So, is it then mature um, maturity and mechanization of our resources, then social prosperity, or is it one unified political or sort of pol um, political political economic framework that we can achieve? social prosperity because for me the idea of africa uh, the africa um, free trade agreement in itself it's exciting when a scientific model can be achieved in boosting that fluidity and that market system being so productive and being more rapid and fluid in itself but that i mean i don't know if um eurocentric interference will sort of eliminate that fluidity and realization of that whole process Yes, uh, fantastic questions. Um, so with regards to the first point, Maha, that you made regarding the uh, goal, the goal being unachievable, um, I have some reservations about that. And I have some reservations. The other day we had a, an address from uh, the prime minister here in Barbados, Mia Motley, and we were discussing, uh, we we're in lockdown, so we were discussing issues around then COVID. 
and she used the, that very British rhetoric of we are at war. Um, and she concluded with, and COVID must be defeated. And I thought, oh, how interesting. COVID must be defeated. So everyone knows that COVID cannot be defeated. COVID is not an adversary. COVID is not an antagonist. Uh, COVID is a virus. So defeat is not possible. But when you say it must be defeated, you've now created a false objective. You've also created an unattainable objective. So what happens then when this lockdown is meant to end in two weeks and COVID is still prevalent? Everyone says, but it's not defeated yet. So of course we must lock down. And what happens after four weeks when it's still prevalent? What happens in those instances? So if you create this, this unattainable objective, I wonder if that ultimately leads to the kind of demoralization that you see among a number of working class or impoverished. The only ones who seem to hold on to it now are, well, technocrats, academics, professional intellectuals in the Gramscian sense, and the middle class. So the wealthy know it's not possible, but they don't care. <laughs> and the poor know that the game is rigged, but it's the middle classes that turn around and say, but we just have to believe. And so that I wonder if ultimately harms, prevents us from achieving or at least pursuing the kind of initiatives that would produce then the social prosperity that Ali was referring to earlier. To your second one, um, third world approaches and decolonization, are these just theory or are they practice? So, and again, I, I suppose it depends on which, in what context we're discussing. them. Now, if I were to say in relation to international law, I would say then that third world approaches to international law have certainly have an, had an impact. So you could even look at these uh, dinosaurs of international law, right? So uh, I think uh, Malcolm Evans, for example. And you see how their textbooks must now account for third world approaches, must now account for feminist approaches, must now account for Marxist approaches. Look at even Afronomics and the success Afronomics has had. Look at Opinio Juris and even inviting someone with my credentials and my background to join it as a contributor. There's a shift that happens. And when that shift happens, it creates opportunity then for the dialogue to change, the debate to change. And we've seen that debate begin to shift. And what, it doesn't mean that it's going to be transformative then in terms of the Kuhnian sense where we now have a scientific revolution. But it does mean that there is greater pressure coming to bear on the structures as they existed historically. Those who were privileged by the past must now adapt to a new future moving forward. And so again, I even think about it. If you look at someone with, again, my academic credentials and my politics being appointed dean of a major faculty of law in what is, for the most part, a rather conservative institution, as I've come to discover. Really interesting to see how that shift, these shifts happen and they do create openings. So if you were to ask me that, I say, yes, third world approaches has had an impact. You can look even at uh, Justice Wera Mantri on the International Court of Justice. <clears throat> and a lot of what he was writing was in dissent. And yet now some of those ideas then, because he brought in a lot of debates about the epistemology, those have been taken up by scholars and even some of the justices in different regional courts, certainly the Caribbean Court of Justice, now account for this in ways that they didn't before. And they're looking to say, okay, well, how does this Caribbean framework of international law relate to this doctrine that was put forward by the ECJ? They're asking that question. And that in itself breeds a new type of confidence. And that we hope filters into young people such as yourselves. And certainly when Ali was speaking, that much was evident. He's saying, Right? that we're experiencing a type of maturity, mechanization, 
That in itself, we're seeing stronger and more robust than policy frameworks. Look at the books then that uh, Gathi, right? How would you pronounce Gathi? Because I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. Do you pronounce it Gathi or Gathi? Gathi. Right, Gathi, right. So I call him James, just so we're clear. I never have to say it in public. <laughs> and when I do, he's never there, so I'm fine. <laughs> so if you look then even at the books that he's producing in relation then to right, company law, and is there a Kenyan or right, an Eastern African or an African approach towards this? Well, once we start to conceptualize that possibility, we have begun, right, Aliza Ali has said, begun to mature. At the same time, I have to say I reject that term because I don't think of myself prior to having done this as having been immature. That is to fall into that Eurocentric trap that what we had before was somehow lesser than. It was right, undeveloped. And I tend to ascribe far more to Walter Rodney's argument about us being underdeveloped. Not that we are underdeveloped, but that we were underdeveloped because that suited ultimately Europe's aspirations. So I don't think then that African structures were immature for that reason, but I also don't think they're immature because of the benchmark that you're using. Because if I compare then, say, securities law as we have them in Egypt versus securities law as they have it in Britain, then is the one in Egypt immature because it doesn't look like the one in Britain? And is the one in Britain the only way that securities should be regulated? And that is where it brings us back to the epistemological question. And that epistemological question is the most challenging of all. Because as you were saying then, yes, right? In Gugi, we have to decolonize our mind. You're right, Collins, fully agree with you on that, undoubtedly. But decolonizing our mind, does that involve disabusing ourselves of the knowledge that we've been inculcated with? And how do we even go about that? How do we disabuse ourselves of what we know? Because ultimately that knowledge has crafted our identities, both our individual and collective identity. So I really like the framing then that Ali uses where he referenced social prosperity. And even though it is just a qualifier, but that social prosperity is different from economic prosperity. Because with economic prosperity, we fall into that trap of accumulation. But if we begin to think of social prosperity, well, this conversation that we're having now is enhancing social prosperity because it's enhancing social capital. We are to walk away from this thinking slightly different, which is why I always say that the role of a pedagogue, the role of an educator is to provoke not to provoke by saying, what if? No, no, not that kind of game. But rather to present the information in a manner that it ultimately elicits this type of dialogue. So I'm going to walk away from this thinking slightly differently than I did before. And where that's going to take me, I'm not exactly sure. If we approach information in terms of the transfer of knowledge, then ultimately I am absorbing, I am consuming, I am just taking on the knowledge of another. But if we create this type of dialogue and we begin with questions, and this is an aside, um, and both um, BCO and Ohio consider this then, it's one of the assessments that I pose to, that I put to my students when I lecture, which I'm not doing these days, one of the assessments is, I have them draft a list of questions that they would ask a particular scholar. After they've read a piece, such as the pieces that you had to, that is the assignment now. Come up with the questions. And once you've articulated those questions, the second part, which they don't realize, because I say the quality of, or the, the grade that you will 
that I will award you depends on the quality of the questions. Descriptive questions are pretty simple. So you'd want to get into those more sophisticated ones. So that's part one of the assignment. Then after they submitted these, part two of the assignment is to answer the questions in the voice of the author, the person that you were asking them to. Because now you have to conceptualize how they think about that subject. And they hate it when they hear that second part, so which is why you can't reveal it in the beginning, because otherwise they come up with much easier questions at the outset. So that's a good tip there. But we're walking away, and what I'm hoping you're walking away with now are more questions. Thank you for that answer. Um, I think Dr. Alabisi had a question. And then we could also take any other, um, like this could be the last round of questions and also have some it questions is, in the chat to read out. It is Professor. Okay, Professor <laughs> Olabisi. Okay, it's actually <laughs> Olabisi, I can we as you see on the screen. Right? <laughs> so, uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating. I was, I was running errands earlier, so I'm happy I was able to catch up with this uh, Chet Stedo Hill. Uh, on the on the talk, so no doubt, I'm sure uh, uh, my brother, uh, you know, uh, has has provoked uh, thoughts. It's fascinating to listen to the high quality level of discussion and the questions, and I think um, you know, I think I think what what got me interested initially was when I raised my hand about the notion of happiness and what it does to the discourse of um, maybe international law and international economic law, international law and development, or whichever one uh, which. It's interesting because yesterday I was um, teaching uh, this group of master's students at Tufts University, where I teach um, them law and development. And, you know, one of the questions that came up was whether happiness could that's not a measure uh, of development, right? Uh, and we spent almost 20 minutes um, intervening. And what's fascinating about these students is that, you know, they have real hand experiences. They've worked uh, in many development agencies. And so coming in with experiences in Buhan, in, you know, uh, in different parts of the world, it became, how do you measure happiness, right? Uh, whose happiness, what is happiness? Right, I mean, really, what is it? So whether it's in the conversation of how, uh, you know, um, Professor Molson's daughter asked the question uh, and his response, you know, is to say, you know, we are because those guys are there. Uh, you know, who says living in the hut is not contentment, right? Uh, who says you needed to modernize, right? Uh, who says Monsanto needed to change, uh, you know, the composition of a lot of the seeds that we grow. I mean, I orange. Uh, I have two more left. I caught it and it was red inside, orange. So I caught it and I thought, wait, did I just buy grapes and I didn't know it was orange? Because grapes is what I associate, right? Some species of grapes. Well, but it was actually orange, right? And I'm putting all these things there to say that, you know, the, the conversations are, as I, as I think I hear Professor Mosin, say it is not to tell you this is the way to think about these issues uh, or that one one critical tradition necessarily solves the problem um, they are complex and i think saying they are complex of course i know doesn't move us forward but but thinking outside the system is also difficult uh, uh, this notion that you know we can we can start something radically new and unheard of. Uh, it's perhaps utopian in my own view. Um, and I think that ship may have sailed. It's the complexity of the world we live in today and how intertwined it is, is difficult. As you start speaking, start speaking about tax, uh, I could not but remember the, the thing around illicit financial flow and the work I'm doing with that. Uh, the complexity around that is, I mean, reveals the, the, the notion of how different actors, which is not just European now, right? National elites, 
uh, are complicit in this have made this particular aspect so difficult. Even a, an ideal so good as um, pioneer status in tax, right? Where you say you're using it to encourage industries to grow and so on and so forth. It harms economies, you know, and I've seen that because these companies make and come and they're able to make their profit within a year. And they've had seven years of tax holiday as a result of being in the pioneer status bucket. Uh, and at the end of the day, you do ask yourself, did we really bring any type of expertise to the people at the end of the day? I mean, I've written on you know, AFCFT and it's coming out in the chapter, uh, but, but that whole discourse is also very interesting as, as you know, uh, Professor Mosin Alta was saying, uh, you think about African states, is Kenya really interested in what Tanzania is interested in? I mean, these are basic questions, but we have to ask ourselves, this whole notion of Pan-Africanism, is it one thing, you know? Is there an ideal? How do we instrumentalize Pan-Africanism as African states? Does the notion of what we support move from one issue to another issue? You see? Uh, so, so, I mean, I mean, I don't have, I'm sorry, I don't think I had a question. I just was, I just, the, 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 the thought just provoked me, right? And I just wanted to say, this is why uh, the work you're all doing in Ohio and, and the team behind this, uh, and with thanks to Molson, is critical, you know, and, and the process of re-engineering ideas through, through thinking uh, is not something that has a seismic impact that suddenly unearths, you know, uh, years of uh, colonial legacies and the ideas that is continues to reproduce. I was on the phone a short while ago and I was talking now and I was just saying with someone that, look, a year ago, the message was, oh, COVID-19 is spreading fast in Europe and the Americas and, in, you know, the Northern America as well. And, you know, why is it that Africans are not getting it? Why are they not dying? Why, you know, and then people are saying, oh, Africans are resilient. They've learned from lessons of, you know, other past pandemics and so on and so forth. All right, that sounds very good. Now, fast forward a year later, I don't know about Kenya, but in Nigeria, and I think you will remember this, we, we discussed this in a meeting a short while ago, Nigerians are dying now from COVID-19 because, not because there's no vaccine. That's the least of the problem, to be honest with you. The bigger challenge is that the majority of the people do not believe that this thing exists. You see, and it's dying, it's killing them. The reason they believe it doesn't exist is not so much the government, actually, it's the church as well, right? So don't want, I don't want to simplify it as saying fake news, but yes, Trump's exit had something to do with that as well. And his celebration of the church as, you know, uh, as, as the message, it is worse when people think going to the hospital to get vaccine means they are effectively ejected with something that creates, you know, that sets them, sets them up for a doom in the life beyond. You know, so these things are complex. And so you can think about how do we even change the mindset of the ordinary African to think that these issues impact him or her and he, has, he or she has to make decisions that are best in his own interest. I don't have an answer. Like the Dean said, we don't have answers to these things. We don't go around telling people this is what to do. But we hope that when opportunities present themselves in pockets, you see, pockets, uh, when the thinking is right, then when you find yourself in policy space opportunities, we hope you do the right thing. That's how the changes come, right? So we won't build an alternative world. Certainly, I don't think that's possible any longer in my own view. So I've enjoyed listening in. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I've just, I just wanted to be here today and listen and learn, you know, and your questions are, are terrific. You guys are great uh, and keep doing a good job. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Professor Mosin, uh, and thanks a lot of you and, and, and Arnold and, and Kelly and, and Collins, you guys and Meha, you're doing fantastic you know, opportunity when I was uh, uh, in the university. I was doing student union and activism instead of this kind of discussions, you know, but it's all come around. Cheers. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Um, uh, are there any other 
any members of the forum that might want to say something that I haven't spoken today? Sanjana, Michelle, Shalene. Hold uh, on. Uh, hold on, sorry. Harizin, can I call you out to say something? Harizin Nambori. Yes, bro. Yes, I can please, say something. Please. Yes, okay. please do. Yeah. I, I joined a bit late. I just want to thank uh, um, uh, Prof for the very good conversation that is going on. Um, and I really, I mean, I, like BC has said, I also wish I had this opportunity when I was like an undergrad because I learned in the um, classical neoliberal model. That's how I was taught and I only sort of met critics, criticism uh, as I went into graduate school because, and also because of a single individual, because I met Professor Gadi in graduate school and then that's when I realized there's a whole new world out there. So it's good to, to, to do this early and to think critically early and to critique early. And I'm, I'm, very, I'm very, very impressed, you know, even thinking for me, I've been like learning a lot, uh, especially thinking about what is economic prosperity and now this idea of social prosperity. I mean, it's a very, you know, empowering idea. And so mine is to really thank you. And I've really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, Sanjana? Um, thank you so much for the conversation today. I think, um, like everybody has said, I've just been trying to digest a lot of the information. Um, so it took me a while to sort of frame my question, I guess. Um, when we were talking about the political economy, um, uh, you'd mentioned something about who should suffer for us to sort of live a more, pros uh, a more prosperous life, right? And for a second, I was thinking, uh, would the people that colonized have even for a second thought in the same way that we were thinking? But I guess that's the difference, right? That we are not trying to build the country or build the continent on the backs of other people. So I guess that's a good thing. But my question is more in relation to, does prosperity for all um, mean this sense of equality where everybody is enjoying the same thing? Or maybe owing to the whole ceiling and floor model that you put that I had also read um, in a Samuel Moyne article, I guess. Or is the question about distributive justice? So prosperity for all, yes, but not in terms of this crude sense of equality where everybody gets the same, but in terms of equity. So there's distributive justice, everybody has enough. So the floor, um, the floor is not too low and the ceiling isn't too high for anyone. And so the floor is just enough. In my opinion, I genuinely believe that the ceiling should have a limit. And, and the minute that we say the ceiling should have a limit, it goes to the first thing that you said about endless accumulation and that's capitalism. So I think then should we not be following that system of capitalism? And that doesn't mean, well, when you say that capitalism should not be followed, the immediate alternative people think of is communism. But I was thinking, is there anything else that we are probably not factoring in? Uh, so yeah, my question was just on distributive justice. Do you think that is what prosperity for all would probably mean? Excellent. Uh, so, uh, BC Harrison, many thanks uh, for your comments. Um, BC, you I'm became sorry. an ad hoc I'm sorry, discussant. Prof. I'm sorry to interrupt. Maybe we can also take Susan's question and then we. Oh, I didn't realize there was another question. Okay. Of course. Susan, are you with us? Uh, Susan Isiko Stuba from Geneva. I'm sorry I will not be able to put on my video, but uh, I thank the Dean. I like to call him that for the presentation and I apologize for being very late. So I'll just pick on the last uh, points which uh, I was able to listen to from the conversation. 
and please bear with me if I, I, I ask questions or I, I make contributions, things that were already highlighted in the time when I was not there. Uh, Professor, uh, I just had a question. This morning I was listening to someone making her exposition on migration. I'm not a migration expert, but she just drew my attention to this. And she was speaking precise about Africa, how we are organized and our thinking and how Africa itself and all Africans themselves or ourselves, we actually seem to implement international law or colonial law more than the colonialists. And bringing that conversation to what we have here, Professor, you've right to challenges we have to, I mean, it's, it's always good to bring, to challenge those, the listeners to think. And I was just thinking about this idea of social capitalism or social capital and economic capital. And then something jumped, I said, actually, whom are we addressing? We are here having a conversation as academics and it's very good, but when we have the decision makers who are quite different or detached. My question to all of us is, do we have some kind of magic wand other than writing and have so many publications, which is good, but do we have some kind of magic wand to get the, those in power or the decision makers to move? Because I would love to be able to do that, frankly. I stop there. Um, okay, uh, that complicates it a little bit because I'll have to admit that I do have a magic wand. Good. <laughs> um, I will pull it out of my drawer shortly and I will show you. Um, no, but let me say that a couple of things. So um, BC and Harrison, yes, uh, thank you for the uh, interventions. Uh, Harrison, I'm pleased to know then that in fact, the, uh, <laughs> the, the social prosperity is, uh, is not my idea. It's a fantastic idea from Ali. So perhaps the two of you might wish to have a conversation then about that. What did Ali mean when he said social prosperity? Um, BC, uh, yes, um, I, I think you're right. These were very high level, it's a high level discussion. Uh, the kind of questions that I'm facing here from uh, these students is uh, not at the undergraduate level, it's not even at the postgraduate level, it's the kind that I would expect if I were sitting in a conference and speaking with my peers. So I'm uh, very pleased with this and uh, um, I had said at the outset, you uh, weren't here so you didn't hear this, I said at the outset that I had heard from others this was going to be an enriching experience for me and it has, so I'm, very, I'm thrilled about that. Now you mentioned happiness and, uh, and, and I'm interested in that idea, this, uh, this happiness, in large part because uh, I've never really bought into that idea of happiness, in large part because of then uh, how fluid it is on some level, and but then uh, how fuzzy it is on, on another. It kind of makes us warm to think in terms of happiness, but I don't know that we can build policy really around that. I have my doubts, particularly because it leads to something that you said there about how do we determine who is, who is actually happy? And this was a comment that was made by an economist here the other day um, in relation, they said, well, who are we to judge? Because we were talking about inequality in Barbados. And they said, who are we to judge if the person who's on the beach, who's happy to live on the beach and, and just live off the, off the sea is somehow um, disadvantaged by these policies? And, I, and I, I'm uncomfortable with that argument <laughs> because in the end, we're looking to legitimize a current state of affair that many of us agree then ultimately is disadvantageous to that individual. It's not to say that they wouldn't want to do that, but it's rather when we ask the question, it's not really whether you have a choice, it's the conditions in which choices are made. So I understand that people who pitch a tent in the park might be happy that they have a tent that they can pitch in the park and a place that they can have shelter and maybe they enjoy the mobility. But are they enjoying that because they don't actually have access to a proper house? Is that why they're enjoying that? I'm not sure and I don't know that the happiness standard can help us there. But I did want to bring something to everyone's attention, which of course you would know about BC because it's appeared in Afronomics, the vulnerability index. So rather than just measuring say GDP, wealth, um, how people are performing, measuring those states then that are vulnerable. 
And because they are vulnerable, should we put in place certain other policies? Should we make available them to them uh, certain uh, special drawing rights, whatever it happens to be, based upon that level of vulnerability? So that sovereign equality has validity. We want to treat all states the same so as to protect borders and so on and so forth and to protect people from outside interference. But at the same time, not everyone is at the same starting position. And because they're not, should we account for the context in which uh, society finds itself? So for example, Barbados, despite the fact that it's a middle income country, because of these high levels of inequality that we suffer, on the vulnerability index, it would score quite high as well as on the Gini coefficient. So really interesting then to think about that, that vulnerability index. Um, I really appreciate the point that you're making about the complexity. I probably disagree with you a little bit on the utopian side, despite the answer that I gave Maha earlier about you know, having those objectives and wanting to have real attainable, measurable objecti objectives. And I probably say that because I'm a dean and I have to talk to uh, the staff and say, I need to know how many publications you are producing that is going to impact on our ranking <laughs> in the Times Higher Education Standards. So I want things that are attainable. I want things that are measurable. And at the, at the same time, I think there's space for a little bit of utopian thinking because it gives us a different type of benchmark. A benchmark that we might think now is utopian, but in truth is only utopian because our thinking is already corralled then by the status quo. Because if we say that something is utopian because it departs greatly from the status quo, well, what if the status quo is diabolic? What if the status quo is brutal? What if the status quo is demonic? then what I consider utopian might actually be right, just a shift away from the brutal that we're facing today. So here in Barbados, for example, we have 32% unemployment, nearing 35, in fact. Right? Um, our debt to GDP ratio is 175%. Right? We are not facing economic uh, challenge. We are not facing economic catastrophe. We are facing economic annihilation. I need a little bit of utopianism. I need something drastically to change because even any improvements in the special drawing rights is not going to address right, the misery that this society will suffer for the years to come because of COVID. That is something to bear in mind. Um, you mentioned the church. I'd, I'm, I'm more than happy to kick the church a little bit, I'll be frank with you. <laughs> and I say that in large part because I see the same type of thinking that we have out here. Um, and yet I know how prevalent the church is across our continent, so I'm cautious how much I say that, what I say about that. Um, we had a couple of more comments, and I, I'm realizing we're, we're past the time, but hopefully we have a few minutes to finish up uh, then. Yes? Okay. Um, so it was an interesting one there that was put uh, in terms of pan-Africanism and the Kenyan and the Tanzanian. And then what if you were to throw in the Algerian and the Moroccan? And I say that because of the divide between the South and the, uh, or Sub-Saharan and uh, Northern Saharan, right? Really interesting, right? As in, I, I hold on to that pan-Africanism. And even here, I was really heartened the other day. We had a, we had a part of our eminent speaker series we had a speaker, she herself is a representative of St. Vincent's at the UN, and she was discussing reform at the Security Council. And so reforming then the voting powers of the Security Council. And she says, we self-identify, right, herself who, because St. Vincent's has a seat on the Security Council now. She says, we self-identify as the fourth African seat. And I was really heartened by that. So that pan-Africanism extends all the way here when we start to think of an Afro-Caribbeanism. Right? So that in itself is heartening. But I take your point. That in itself might be a type of utopia that is just too great for us to ever achieve, in large part because the fractions that are in place are too strong. And because of the ties that each one of these African countries, each one of these African regions enjoys then to Europe. And so our commitment is largely to the north rather than necessarily to the south. And so that is one of the challenges that we'll forever face across the continent. But then to bring it to Sanjana and then Susan's uh, two questions there. 
the magic wand. And the magic wand is what I'll, I'll, I will end with. Uh, so who should suffer? Uh, right, who should suffer? So I appreciate you asking that question. And I appreciate you asking that question uh, for the simple reason that you're acknowledging that somebody will. And that, I think, is a good starting point. We recognize then that somebody will suffer. And what is it that we can do to alleviate some of their suffering? So we're acknowledging that suffering is a product of capitalism. And it's a product of the economic order that we've established. I really appreciate that acknowledgement because, again, there's too much of that fantastical thinking out there. And it is just believe, 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 and eventually things will be better. But what you're saying then, Sanjana, is, well, no, it doesn't matter how much you believe, you still will suffer. You will remain immiserated. And we're looking then for ways to improve and then alleviate that suffering. So I appreciate that. Is it a matter then of distributive justice rather than this crude equality? Uh, I think you're right. And we often brought in these ideas then of uh, justice and thinking of justice in different ways. You have uh, Nancy Fraser, a political philosopher, who spoke about it as a three-part way in terms of justice. It has to do with cultural recognition. It has also to do with um, political representation. Um, and then it has to do with economic distribution. So we have to think in terms of culture, brings in epistemology. We have to think in terms of politics, representation. We can think we have a but also economics, we have food to eat. So if we begin to think of distributive justice in those terms, rather than just thinking of it in that very narrow way about economics, I think you're certainly on to something. So justice then that we enjoy is not in the abstract, but it's rather how it ultimately influences the lives that we live. So it's very much about the here and now, as much as it is about what we would like to achieve in the future. So in the here and now, when you look at it and say, having these levels of inequality, what is it then that we had our first trillionaire the other day or something of the sort, um, Bezos and uh, that other clown at, what's his name? I can't even recall. He's a buffoon who insults people, calls them pedophiles and such for trying to save children from caves. Remember him? Somebody knows him, no? Elon Musk, thank you, Khalil, there we go. <laughs> yes, so if you were to look at that situation and the acknowledgement and saying, it doesn't matter what system is in place. It doesn't matter which definition of justice you abide by, ecclesiastical, Eurocentric, right? Um, Muslim, I, I, I don't care which one. You have to look at that situation and say, that is wrong. I cannot have these individuals living in abject misery and some individuals then ultimately, right, enjoying that much luxury. That was, has to be at least a starting point. That in itself is wrong. And so when you say to me distributive justice, I say, okay, good. Let us talk in that way. Because there clearly is some form of redistribution that must take place. Because the kind of models that we have working today are not working and we have to do differently. So I very much appreciate that line of thinking. Which brings us then to the magic wand. Now, when I say I have the magic wand, Susan, and I appreciate this, uh, being able to conclude on that. And I said, yes, it's in the drawer. Um, and in fact, it's not. And I say it's not, and I'll say something that will be sound a little soft, and I'm happy for it to sound soft. Uh, the magic wand is right here, right? And I'm pointing directly at my chest. So that is where the magic is. The magic is what I feel. The magic is what I believe. The magic is what I advocate, what I struggle, what I fight for. That is where the magic is. So all of this other stuff that we're talking about in terms of it, and yes, it is complex, and yes, it is challenging, and yes, it, it has to do with maturation, and it has to do with FDIs, and we have an adversarial system, and on and on and on, and all of that is there. And I say, yes, you're right. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, do you believe, do you genuinely believe that somehow a group of people who had the audacity, the brutality to colonize parts of the world should continue to enjoy the fruits of that colonization? If your answer is no, which it should be, 
then the debate becomes, how can we redress the current state of affairs? And that becomes what we're working towards. Because the debate as it stands is not there. The debate as it stands is how can we grow the economy? How can we grow GDP? How can we increase wealth? But we know that is the debate because the market, the market system, which I opened with, is plutocratic. And so, of course, if the market is plutocratic, then you want systems that are going to continue to produce similar outcomes for those who are privileged by a market system, meaning the wealthy. But if you start off and say, hey, listen, right? what took place was wrong. We don't ascribe to that anymore. And there are some legacies. And we have to think of ways of redressing those legacies. Well, become more attractive. The debate shifts away from just growing GDP and $1 a day sufficient, $2 a day sufficient, whatever it happens to be. It takes us away from that and it takes us towards a meaningful conversation of how do we want people to live? Not the economic metrics, but rather something else. And that is what I say is magical. It begins with that position. Because if you don't have that position, then you get caught up in all of that technocratic malarkey that is there to distract. Well, really, it has to do with 0.01% then contribution to aid rather than 0.001%. And I'm using a fallacious number just to underscore the point. That is a distraction. If you begin from the position then that what we see today is inequitable, it is unjust, there is too much suffering, there are too many people who are disadvantaged, and all of that, and this is the key point, all of that is structured in that way to benefit a minority of society. So we understand that the system in place is deliberate. Well, that is where we work towards redressing what produces that system which is why I am in favor of the FTA, just to be clear. But I keep saying, are we doing this because we want to claw some of the privileges that Europe enjoys or because we want to distribute some of those privileges across the continent? That is a different position. Qualitatively, it is a different position to adopt. Philosophically, it's a different position to adopt. Ideologi ideologically, it's a different position to adopt. And that is not the answer that I have heard. And it's certainly not the answer that is coming out of my country. Egypt is not pursuing joining then the FTA because it wants to redistribute wealth. That is not why. So until that happens, the FTA right, is nothing but right, the next stage of colonization, nothing more. So you say to me, decolonize, I say, okay, forget everything that I just said to you now. Let us then build a project moving forward, and this is what I end on. Let us build a project moving forward that looks to decolonize the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. That is what I want. And that is what this group, I hope, will lead. How do you decolonize the FTA? But it's not even alive yet. And I say, but still, I don't want it to live if it's going to reproduce what Europe right, has cursed the world with at all. I want it stillborn. So let that, I think, would be a good starting point then for the continent. I'll end on that. Uh, thank you very much um, for the insightful and wonderful session. Um, and thank you to everybody. I think... Oh, I'm sorry, I thought there was a raised hand. It's a club, which is bizarre. Um, <laughs> I'd like to invite um, Professor Oyo Omiuni, sorry if I pronounced the last name wrong, um, 
to give us some parting words um, and perhaps close the session. Um, he is the director of the forum. Um, apologies if you hear it, um, but it, tell, it reminds us that it's weekend and um, even during the week these days, children running around because of the current um, circumstances that we are all very familiar with. Um, I cannot thank you enough, um, Professor Morrison, for a wonderful presentation. Um, this is the first time I have um, heard you speak. And so I was really looking forward to this. And it has really been en enriching, provoking, thought provoking. Debating. And you've left us with, as um, Anne said in the chat, questions. And um, it reminded me one of the reasons why we do this, which is that we're able to, to get people to imagine, to reimagine sometimes, and um, also sometimes to, to um, question things that they have held so sacrosanct for perhaps all of them up to, this, up to the point they hear you speak. And I believe you've done that for us today. And the last point you made about decolonizing the the um, the, F, the, F, the, F, the FTA, sorry. When you set your initial parameters at the beginning of what decolonization could look in terms of starting positions, you could have just told us that that was your ending position because that was excellent. It is indeed one way to answer some of the questions that Collins asked. You know, where, who, what. How do we do this? And you're right, the, the, the FTA is a starting point. And, and uh, the webinar you referred to that we um, had that question about, you know, is this a reproduction of neoliberalism or is this something really African? And it's something that's kept me thinking about it all as well as to what exactly have we done differently or are we doing differently? Are we true to the spirit of Pan-Africanism and not just spirit here, spirit talk, but in terms of practical measures and steps. And I think we are in a position to do so. And it all starts, I believe, with having the right capacity in, in, in place in terms of human capacity, building the right minds, mindset with people um, like we have in this forum. And, and you mentioned something which I would reiterate and it's something I've experienced every time I've engaged with them. The questions they ask, it's not on the graduate level, It's it's if not even postgraduate level sometimes, it's actually really intellectually stimulating and really um, challenging. And that's why uh, I'm, I'm throwing out an open challenge to, to BC that we will need you here uh, as um, whenever time permits to also come and engage. So it's a good thing. Thank you, BC, for coming. Thank you, Harrison, for coming also. Thank you, Susan, for coming. We are really, really happy to have you uh, um, participate in this session with us. And most importantly, my, my greatest appreciation goes to each and every one of you representative. You've taken out a part of your weekend to come and hear us speak for a number of weekends now. We don't take this for granted. Um, if anything that the, the pandemic has taught us is teaching is as good as being able to engage with your students. And um, you make that happen. I wish I could get my students over here to just show their faces. That would be, that would be a good start. So um, thank you so much for taking our time to come. Um, <laughs> thank you so much time, Jeff, um, for the interesting, amazing questions. And um, so we look forward to the next session. And um, Prof, we will be still be calling on you in terms of mentoring people and you know point out that knowledge because we believe the next generation needs to, well, this generation needs to be equipped with the right um, guidance uh, and that comes with mentorship um, so that that's it for me and I would just um, hand over to BC for a moment he had an announcement to make yeah thank you very much uh, Ohio and uh, thanks again uh, 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 Professor Mustan you know this this thing you can't thank people enough uh, for the time they give so freely uh, for events like this on weekends and you know you guys I have to thank you all as the organizers and the and the participants, you are investing in yourself, and you know you can choose today to I'm sure socialize at this time or do other things. But you know doing dry stuff of thinking uh, for over two hours in an engaged form 
is a seed you are sowing. You never really know when you will reap this. Uh, don't be discouraged as you go through the days, you know. Sometimes you feel like, oh my God, did I just waste my time? You know, how does this connect to my exam that I write tomorrow? Uh, but these things will come. You know, when you finish, I'm sure some of you wish to proceed your studies abroad. Uh, you know, you wish, to, you wish to do things in the world. These are the thought processes that will help you stay, you know, differently uh, when you prepare your applications, when you express your thought. And no, getting to them this early means you will own them when the time comes. You see, some of us who came across this in the course of our graduate programs, uh, have had to check. Sometimes you're like, can I really go this far with this thought? Maybe I should try to, you know, align myself with the establishment and, you know, show that I can play the game on both sides uh, until you eventually find out who cares, right? It's my approach to thinking and I can own it and defend it respectfully. So thank you everyone for that. Just two minutes. You have heard Professor Mosin, Fagba Ibo, uh, and many others speak. Thank you very much for all you do in terms of trying to summarize their pieces. But I'm sorry, I'm going to challenge you all, like Professor Musindi, that is not the best way to do it. I'm sure he doesn't want you to just summarize his thought. He said, you know, write questions, do those. Now write critical reflections. There are so many themes that have come up here. Part of what Afronomics Law Academic Forum does is in addition to these debates, you have to commit these thoughts to writing. In redesigning the new website that I hope most of you have gone to see, uh, the academic forum has a whole space of its own. And we won't populate that space with summaries of these great speeches. You want to engage with them. You want to now bring in his other work and engage with his thinking. You don't have to agree with him, I'm sure. The joy for us is not in people agreeing with us. You can agree with some, but also show some of the beautiful questions and thoughts you've, you've done here. So I'm encouraging you all. I know Arnold has done this. I know Kelly, who's left, has done this. But you have open invitation. You all have open invitation to write. Because those writings in your, in your CVs develop your thought. And that's how you put yourself out there in a good way. And you know, Dr. Omiunu is here. Send it to him first. He'll review, right? And then he sends it to us. But we want to read you guys, okay? You want other people to read your thoughts. People who are not able to attend won't get the full benefits of this event by just reading a paragraph summary. No, you can't do that justice. So we hope, uh, on behalf of all the editors of, of Afronomics Law, that you all take up this challenge. Don't feel like your writing is poor. No, we will accommodate you. We will embrace you. We will encourage you. Nobody knows it all. Nobody, when we started, our writings were poor. I can tell you mine, and I'm still improving in my own writing, right? We are all aiming to improve. So uh, uh, you should feel free to be vulnerable in this group. This is us now, right? And we won't say, oh God, it's so bad. We won't publish it. We'll give you tips will give you ideas to finish it, and then we'll publish it. Even if it takes three months, it will get published. Okay? So that's all I want to say. We would love to read you. Please take up these thoughts, write, engage with them. 1,000 words, 1,500 words. Pull them together, send them out, right? And then, you know, that few goes out. You wait for the next one. So uh, I'll see you guys soon, uh, but thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mosin. We'll talk on the other side. Uh, I think Kuchiko, you could say something and then end the session, or because you're the host. Oh, wow. <laughs> the only thing I could see is still a question, so I don't know whether that's okay. So I think I should just <laughs> end the session. But but really, honestly speaking, yeah, in your position as a dean, you you put up a question: What can you do as a dean? So maybe I can return that to you. What are you doing currently? Because just like looking at your writings. Even this session itself, it really is clear that you must have made of, of your faculty some kind of liberated zone, like a zone free of all these enslaving ideas. 
like i don't know but now how do you get that to the students how do you challenge your faculty members i don't know like uh otherwise the session is over people can feel free to go you can just answer that as well as they are leaving just in the interest of time people can just leave So you would like me to answer that question, Njigo, then? Um, so just to uh, quickly then, what I will say then in terms of um, what I'm trying to do as a dean. So you have to understand and it's the context. And I think context is relevant here. Um, and I, I pointed out we are facing economic annihilation. Um, and I, I don't use that term lightly. 40% uh, of the GDP of Barbados and a number of other uh, islands across the Caribbean are is uh, intertwined with tourism. And there is no tourism. So it effectively means that everything is on the verge of collapse. And that's a, a, a massive then uh, challenge, not just for uh, the region, but also for the university, because our university then comes from, our funding for the university comes from the governments. So without that, then um, yeah, there's virtually nothing that can be done. So the focus very much on my end at the minute, and this is going to sound very disappointing, I imagine, then it's not romantic at all. Uh, my focus is very much on raising funds um, and raising funds then for the faculty, raising funds for students, raising funds for um, bursaries, scholarships, because what we have is a large pool of young people who want to study then whether it's law or anything then at the UWI. And what we have is an institution with a number of academics who want to teach them, but there isn't the finance to make it happen. So I need to find then different um, donors, uh, funding agencies. I need to find a variety then of actors who are willing then to facilitate that so that we don't find ourselves then effectively regressing in terms of the level of, of education that the region enjoys. And that is the first challenge. The second challenge then that we face is the brain drain and the youth drain. The average age in Barbados is 42. You can imagine that. So in Egypt, it's 24. Big difference. So young people such as yourselves who are educated here or even who are not educated here look to depart immediately. And whether it's to go to uh, the north of uh, the Americas, whether it is to go to uh, Europe, whether it's to go elsewhere specifically. So that is a challenge for us. So it is trying to develop an educational institution and program that is attractive then to young people where they say, yes, I could go there, but I'm actually very excited about going then to the UWI. So that's the second thing that I'm trying to do. So we're in the process of redesigning the program to include debates about this kind of stuff. Um, and the third one is, uh, and it's a shame that BC is gone, the third one is uh, Pan-Africanism. And why do I say that? Instead of always looking to the North, as I said, even the African continent does, it's instead looking across the waters and saying that is where we can find a different type of support. So for example, you're pursuing this FTA. We've been integrating in the region since the 90s. So when you're looking for expertise on regional integration, you don't need to look to, the, to Europe. You actually need to look to the Caribbean community, otherwise known as CARICOM. So the focus very much, my focus as Dean is on those three fronts. So it's why I said, it's not particularly romantic. Uh, it's actually kind of bland at times but we're at the point where I really need to be utilitarian because I don't have, we don't have the funds then to pay for students to actually come to the university. And even if they can afford to come to the university, they can't afford the housing, they can't afford the food, they can't afford to live. So we have families who are choosing be A or child B or to university because you have to choose. So which one are you going to take the chance on? That's a pretty dire then diagnosis of the region and the nature of the challenges. So this kind of a session, which is really exciting and really in the end and thrilling. And as I said, I feel enriched. is very different from what my daily 
grind is because the daily grind is at least about keeping uh, keeping the lights on within the faculty which is a real challenge then for a third world state thank you very much bro thank you very good. it was a pleasure everyone many thanks for that i enjoyed it greatly and i look forward to seeing you again very soon i hope all the best everyone yeah thank you